All right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, and I know we do have some groups joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And today is particularly exciting for a couple of reasons. First of all, it is midway through our November extravaganza highlighting conservation. We have gone all over the world in support of amazing people highlighting their incredible work to conserve amazing places and species around the globe. We just wrapped up with Dominique Gonsalves all the way in Mozambique, uh, but so hopefully you get a chance to watch that on our YouTube channel. All our programs stay there forever. Today is also exciting because it is World Fisheries Day. So November 20th, World Fisheries Day. And so we are partnering with Fisheries and Oceans Canada to highlight three incredible scientists that work with them uh, to conserve species, understand some of the creatures and places in our oceans. We're joined all the way in St. John's, Newfoundland, one of my favorite places in the entire world that you've never been, everyone should go, uh, by Hilary Rockwood. So she is an aquatic science uh, biologist and she's going to tell us a little bit about her own personal story today, some of the cool work she gets to do, and then we're going to dive in with Q. A. So, Hillary, thank you so, so much for joining us and take us away. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today to listen to my talk about becoming a biologist and my job at DFO. So, my name is Hillary Rockwood, and I'm an aquatic science biologist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, which is the Canadian government department that studies the fisheries and the ocean. Uh, I work at the Northwest Atlantic. Fisheries Center in St. John's, Newfoundland. And today I'll tell you a little bit about how I got my job and my uh, project that I work on at work. So uh, this first picture, um, it's me on the left and then two of my student employees, Elijah and Carly, and they are working on the Citizen Cod program, which I will talk about uh, in a little bit. But first, you might be asking, when did I know I wanted to be a marine biologist? Well, I was about as big as that kid in the photo. I, When I was about uh, seven or eight, I went to SeaWorld and I was down in San Diego and visiting some family and friends and um, we went to SeaWorld and I saw Shamu in the big tank. Um, and I was completely mesmerized and I knew in that moment I'm super interested in whales and the ocean and everything. To, to do with that, so that's what I want to do when I want to grow up. So um, I started planning early. When I got to high school, I took a lot of science and math courses. <laughs> uh, for example, I took biology, chemistry, physics, and advanced environmental science. I also took a lot of math courses. Uh, for example, I took geometry, trigonometry, and even advanced calculus. So I learned a lot about science and math even before I graduated high school. Uh, once I was done in high school, I went straight into post-secondary education. So I went to university. I was living in California at the time, actually, in 2010. Um, I graduated from the University of California in Santa Cruz. I did my Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology, which also included a really cool course uh, called Marine Ecology Lab, where um, for the first five weeks of the course, we went on field trips every other day. And um, on the other days, we were collect or we were taking the data that we had collected on the field trips and we were writing up reports and it was really then when it definitely solidified for me that I wanted to do this as a career because I had so much fun in this course I thought it was the coolest course ever and then for the second half of the course we were supposed to create our own research project collect all the data analyze it and then present it to the class so what I did was I did a course or I did a project called um, muscle bed predation in intertidal waters in Santa Cruz. So what I did is I went out to the tide pools and I collected some mussels. I also collected some sea stars and I brought these back to the lab and I put them in tanks and then I basically took some mussels, took some sea stars, put them together and then I watched the, well I didn't watch, but I studied how the um, sea stars 
uh, ate the mussels? Did they eat only big ones? Did they eat only little ones? Did it depend on size? Did it depend on how many were in there? And so that was really my first independent research project I've ever done. And I thought it was so cool. I loved it. Uh, once I graduated, I did spend a little more time in California, but I eventually decided I wanted to go to grad school. At that time, my parents were living in St. John's, Newfoundland, which is where I'm from. Um, and so I decided to move back um, closer to my parents and attend Memorial University of Newfoundland. So I did my Master of Science in Biology at Memorial University of Newfoundland and I graduated in 2016. When I was there, I did a project called um, Predator, uh, sorry, not predator-prey interactions, that was the other project, um, spatial distributions and diets of cod and cod-like fishes. So um, what, how I studied that was I went out to sea, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but I went out to sea with my lab, we collected fish, we collected the stomachs from the fish, and then we also collected data on where exactly we were finding the fish, and I analyzed that data for my master's thesis, which is basically a very, very, very long research paper. I think mine was about 130 pages long, which sounds crazy, but when there's so much information to look through, you can really write a lot. And a lot of that was pictures and graphs and things as well. So uh, again, I mentioned a little bit my hands-on research experience. Um, when I did a study, a study abroad semester in Australia, I went to Brisbane and I worked in a paleontology and biomechanics laboratory. So when I was there, I was assistant to a PhD candidate named Tamara Fletcher. And what I did was basically on the first day, they gave me a huge rock. It was just a round boulder, didn't look any different from any other huge rock you might see around. Um, what I was supposed to do with that was I put it in a giant vat of acid. And so the acid broke down the rock, slowly dissolved it. And then every day I would come in, I would take the rock out using gloves because I didn't want to burn my hands. Um, and then I would, just like how you see in the movies, I would take a little paintbrush or a toothbrush and I would brush away at that dissolved rock material. So when I started, I just had this big round rock. Um, some of the other people in the lab, they had rocks where like things were sticking out. So you could tell, okay, there's gonna be a fossil in there, but mine was just a big round rock. So I was like, okay, maybe we'll find something, maybe not. Um, eventually, my rock dissolved enough that it cracked right in half, and then within there, there was definitely something. So I started kind of brushing away at it very carefully, and inside, I found the skull of a 98 million year old crocodilian, one of the oldest species on record, which was the coolest experience ever. Um, I actually was in Australia back in January and I went to visit the um, professor who um, employed me in this lab and he showed me some additional fossils they found since then as well as fossils of giant footprints of dinosaurs and things like that. And again, just getting that experience was so cool and also looked really good on my resume. Um, I also did some terrestrial ecology field work. So looking at um, sand dunes, um, different types of soil and substrate habitat analysis. So this was also, this was happening in Australia and I also did some of this in Santa Cruz. Um, I did some forest studies in um, Australia. So we were on this a place called Fraser Island. It's an island completely made out of sand. And you think, okay, what grows in sand? Not much, grass, a, a small plants, but this sand island supports an entire rainforest. So we were in the rainforest and we were studying it. We also went down to the dunes and we studied what kind of, um, what kind of plants grow in the dunes and all that good stuff. I also did some marine ecology field work, so looking at animals that lived 
in or around the water. I did a mark and recapture study. So we went out to the tide pools. We caught little fish called gobies. We marked them by just snipping off the tiny corner of their fin. They probably weren't too happy about that, but it, it was pretty small a little bit. Um, Holothurian spatial distribution. So a Holothurian is a sea cucumber, and we were looking at where on the reef they like to live. Um, predator prey interactions, which is what I was studying um, in the lab with the mussels and the um, sea stars, as well as Battleria dispersion, which that's a kind of sea snail. And we were looking at where they like to live. When I went off to grad school, I said I went on an offshore trip. It was a 28 day offshore research trip. I lived on the boat, I ate on the boat, I you know, played board games on the boat. That was my life for a full 28 days. I lived out there and every single day we would go fishing and we would collect fish for samples and also keep track of where we were catching different species and we were also putting tags in fish. We were doing a lot of cool stuff out there. I was out there with a group from my lab, so we were working on and collecting data for a lot of different projects, which was very cool because I get I got to see the kind of work that a lot of different scientists do, not just my own work. And then when I came home, I had a lot of laboratory work to do. So remember I said I was collecting stomachs? Well, when I got home, they were all frozen. I had to defrost them, cut them open, open them up, and then see what was inside because I wanted to know what these fish were eating. So it's a pretty long story, but um, if I'm going to condense it, I started university in 2006. I graduated my undergrad in 2010, started my master's degree in 2013, and graduated with that degree in 2016. And now, I'm stuck. I love marine biology. I'm never going to leave. And then in 27, or 2016, uh, just over four years ago, I started working for D DFO. And that's another place I'm sticking around and they're never going to get rid of me because that is my dream job. I love working there. I love the people that I work with. And I get to do fun, cool, interesting um, research that really helps the communities as well. So at DFO, what do I do? Uh, on the front page, it said I'm aquatic science biologist. So I work with the science branch and the major roles of the science branch are to study the environment and also the study the fish that we um, catch to eat and catch for other reasons, but also the fish that we don't eat, just the fish that are living around in our oceans. I'm part of the marine fish species at risk and fisheries sampling section. So what our section does is we study fish that are at risk. So in Newfoundland waters, that includes wolf fish, um, some species of shark, some species of skate, so like um, stingrays and stuff like that. We don't have stingrays up here, but that's what they look like, the flat, flappy, fish, um, as well as some other fish called grenadiers and hakes, lumpfish. Lumpfish are really cute because they kind of bob up and down in the water. They're very round and they're very friendly. Um, but what I work on specifically is the Citizen Cod program, and I'm the supervisor of that program, and I've been working um, with that program since summer of 2017. So I've been doing it for quite a few years now. And um, that program is more closely tied with the fisheries sampling section. So what this, the fisheries sampling part of our section. So what that part of the section does is they go out to fish plants, they go to wharves, and they um, any fish that was caught to be processed to eat or to sell, that gets sampled by us first so we can um, learn a bit more about the fish that are being caught and um, make sure you know things are staying safe, stable and if they're not, are they going down, are they going up? It's just a good way to learn about what's going on in the water um, as far as it con connects to the fish that we catch um, commercially, which is for selling or for eating. So, um, 
what citizen science? So we call it citizen COD because we rely on the public to participate in our scientific research. Um, and what citizen science does in general is, you know, if you have um, 100 scientists working for DFO across the country, you know, those 100 scientists can maybe be collecting data in 100 different places at once. But as you know, you know, animals, plants, the environment, you, it's everywhere. So you're going to need more than 100 people to get a really good idea of what's going on. So when we encourage the public to participate, participate in scientific research, it expands our reach and we can collect a lot more data and observations. Um, in addition to this, we can spread awareness about um, environmental problems we have or maybe things that we don't know so much about and we want to learn more about. And um, as well, we spread awareness about the work that we do in our department. So, that why did the CISM COD program get started? Um, well, we collect data from citizens who are out fishing with their friends and family. This program, instead of sampling the commercial fishery, we sample the recreational fishery. So every summer in Newfoundland, people can go out on their boats with their family and friends, and they can catch up to five ground fish a day. So what ground fish are, most people, um, end up bringing in cod. Uh, you can also bring in flatfish, so flounders that live on the bottom. A ground fish is really any fish that kind of lives on the bottom of the sea. Um, what we do with this um, project is we hire high school students from local communities and they go out and they measure the catch and they also talk to the fishers because we collect um, observations from them asking them how was it out on the water was it hard to find fish was it easy were they plentiful did you see whales out there did you see sharks did you see birds we learn a lot about what's going out on the water by talking directly to the people who are out there fishing so we see this program as a win-win it fills a knowledge gap for us so it teaches us more about the size and number of fish that are coming in from the recreational fishery. And we hope one day this can be used to help us assess the stock. So find out a little bit more about the size and the health of the stock. And it also um, introduces students who live locally to the work that we do and hopefully make them interested in maybe becoming a marine biologist in the future. Here's a couple pictures of a student. So you'll see I'm wearing an orange shirt. I'm wearing my Citizen Cod shirt today. Well, I don't know if you can see me. Either way, you'll see me when we do the question and answer. I'm wearing my orange Citizen Cod shirt today. We have some students here holding some of our record-breaking fish. These are fish, you know, that are 90 or 100 centimeters long, you know, three feet or more in length, so pretty big fish. Um, usually these fish are pretty heavy, so sometimes it takes two people to hold them, as you can see here. Uh, I'll show a video of, a, it's very short, um, of the students measuring the fish on the wharf. It's kind of hard to hear. So um, what one student does is one student measures the fish and calls out the measurements, the length measurements to the partner. And then the partner will write that down while they talk to the fishers and ask them questions like, how long did you spend fishing? Did you notice any interesting wildlife out on the water? Um, what was the weather like? Did you have to search around for the fish or did you find them right away? We find out a lot of what we call anecdotal information um, by talking to the fishers. So in the first summer, Citizen Cod was on the go. We measured over 25,000 fish over the course of the summer. And I think the exact number was 26,260. So you can imagine that's a lot of work. Um, I'm currently working on entering the data from this summer, but I think we're going to exceed probably 30,000 fish this year because we were really busy and the program has grown bit by bit every year. And this year was our biggest year. We had the most students working in the most communities. So I expect there's going to be a lot of fish measurements by the end of uh, when I finish entering all the data.
So you might be wondering, how can I be a citizen science scientist? Well, in Canada, the government of Canada has a citizen science portal. It's very easy to find. It's as easy as typing to Google citizen science Canada, and it'll be the first link you see. So um, there's a lot of different projects on the go right now. Um, and if you go on the website, there's so many examples and they're all across the country. Um, for example, agroclimate impact, which looks at agricultural impacts um, and the impact of weather and climate conditions in your region. Birds Canada, you can volunteer to report different birds that you see in your area, um, which is a great um, COVID-19 activity, actually. I started bird watching when I was in lockdown because it just started from being at home so often and just looking out my window and seeing how many birds were around. And then I put out a bird feeder and then even more birds came. And then I started walking around my community and um, the surrounding forested areas to look at birds. So Birds Canada, you can um, log on there and let them know what birds you see in your, in your community. Uh, the Canadian Wildlife Health, Health Cooperative uh, is where you can report um, sick or dead wildlife that you see. So if you see, you know, an animal on the side of the road, or if you're going on a hike and you see an animal that looks like it might be sick, um, you can report that to the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. Another one is eButterfly, um, where you can report and track butterfly sightings. And those are just a couple of the examples. Um, there are so many. You can tag trees, you can report earthquakes, you can report shark sightings, bat watch. There's so many options. And um, now that we have internet access, these things might not have been possible 10, 20, definitely 30 years ago. But now that we are so connected by the internet, we can share these um, citizen science observations with uh the experts, and that really helps the research. There's also the hashtag science around me on Twitter. And if you search that hashtag, you'll see um, posts by so many different organizations. Uh, I've got it pulled up here right now. There's TED Talks, there's um, scientists, there's universities, there's government agencies um, posting on Twitter with that hashtag, and there's lots of videos and pictures you can look at. So that's a cool way to um, research citizen science opportunities in your area and also across the country. So you might be asking, okay, I want to be a marine biologist. What are some things I can do to help my cause? Uh, I would definitely um, recommend volunteering. If you know anyone or your parents know someone who's a scientist, maybe they can put you in touch with them or that scientist can put you in touch with someone who needs volunteers to help them. Learning how to code is very um, important because um, especially in DFO, we really value people who know how to do coding because we have to do pretty complicated mathematical and statistical um, analysis with all the data that we collect. So if you know how to code, people really, really like that. That'll give you an edge. Also taking statistic courses, that ties into the same thing. And then obtaining practical experience. So um, you can get that from volunteering. You can get that through school projects. Um, there's lots of ways to get practical experience, but that's why I touched on my hands-on experience that I um, that I got over the years. All right, so that is it, and I'll take your questions. Well, thank you so, so much, Hillary. If you want to come out of screen share so you can see us again, we'd love to have a conversation. Uh, we've got groups joining in in Texas, Ontario, British Columbia, all on YouTube too. So welcome into all our, our teachers there. If you want to share questions in the chat bar, please do. Uh, before we dive in, I want to note two quick things. One is we have our own citizen science project here, all about getting out in nature, exploring, bird watching, sharing those observations. So backyardbio.net, we're launching that in May. We did a pilot of it in September. So we'd love to have you guys take part of your keen. And secondly, after coding, uh, Certainly here in Canada, 
Kids Code Jeunesse is one of the best organizations for this. There's all sorts of amazing training workshops, programs that they do live and, and virtually, and they've got a really exciting campaign right now called Kids 2030. So check that out, uh, and it is a, a, something that a lot of our scientists increasingly are mentioning. It's a, a great tool to help you guys uh, get the skills you need to end up in a cool job like Hillary's. So with that, let's uh, dive in with questions. I'm gonna go to Mr. Foy's class first, and they're joining us in the Sudbury area. All day we've had great Sudbury classes. Mr. Foy, come on in, demute your mic, and go for it. Wants to work, there you go. <laughs> okay, yeah, the, the students have been following along here. It's uh, it's nice to see. Um, one of the things that they're wondering is, is uh, they wanna know uh, how many times you've actually been out uh, studying fish. They, they, they're they impressed with, uh, with all the different kinds you've studied, but roughly they want to know how often are you out there? Um, well, back in 2016, I was done with my degree and I moved to BC and I worked as a fisheries observer. So I was going out to sea um, on fishing boats, um, you know, a few times a month. Um, but when I was in university, I went out on that one four week research trip um, in 2016, when I was a fisheries observer, I'd say I probably went out uh, maybe 20 times. And then I also, in 2016, near the end of the year, went, um, well, I guess late summer, I went on a five-week-long research trip through the Northwest Passages, which was really, really cool because we were out there collecting plankton, which, uh, and at that time, it was the largest scale plankton research survey that had ever been done in the Northwest Passages. So that was another long trip. And then I said that I started with DFO just over four years ago. And that fall, I started as a seagoing technician and I went on three trips with them. And then since then, I've been going on two to four trips a year. So what does that add up to? A few dozen a trips, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very, very cool. You're one of the people that uh, you mentioned so many different places you've had the chance to work, which is really fascinating. And you mentioned all the schooling that it took to get there. But now you're in a role where you get to go all over the world in pursuit of some really, really cool science. So I, I love that we've got a chance to highlight all this today. Great question, Mr. Foy's class. Uh, Mr. Hashi's class also joining us uh, in Sudbury. If you guys want to come in, deem your mic. Go for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hillary. We have a question from one of my students, uh, Haley. Haley is uh, from Gore Bay, Ontario, which is on Manitoulin Island in uh, Lake Huron. Um, and her question is, is there a difference between an aquatic science biologist and a marine biologist? And if there is, what, what's the difference? That's a good question. Um, aquatic science biologist just expands um, the study to anything aquatic. So that can be rivers, lakes, or oceans. Marine biologists, marine usually just relates to the ocean. So there are some, um, aquatic science biologist is a job title that I share with many people across the country. So I personally only study the marine environment, so in the ocean, but there are also aquatic science biologists who only work on lakes or only work in rivers and some work in both. Um, so the term aquatic science biologist is just used to kind of cover anyone who works um, on biology in the water. So instead of just the ocean. Yeah. Fantastic. I was wondering if we were going to get that question. Um, Miss Spicer class, are you guys are 9 through 12s. I know sometimes high schoolers are a little reluctant to ask questions on camera. So let me know in the chat bar if you do have questions, and I will come to you live. Uh, and we'd love to hear from you if you do. Uh, while we're waiting for that, what I'm going to do is bring in Mr. McGuire's class, joining us in Powell River, British Columbia. Uh, and his class's question is, what species of fish do you feel are the most in danger? Oh, that's a tough question. Uh, I think if you asked... 20 different scientists, you'd get 20 different answers. And it really depends on where you live. So um, right now, hmm, I'm trying to think of some of the most endangered ones in Newfoundland. Um, ones that we, when we go out to sea and if we catch one of these species, we do a lot of work to make sure it um, is taken care of when it comes onto the ship and so we can return it to the water safely. And those are wolf fish. 
Um, wolffish are long, like their bodies kind of are big at the top and they kind of are eel-like, but they just kind of, uh, they taper down to a point almost. Um, and those, there are four different wolf fish in, um, in Newfoundland and three of them are uh, considered species at risk, either threatened, endangered, all those things. So I think for, uh, out of all the fish that I've, you know, come in contact with, I think wolf, those wolf fishes are um, the first ones that come to mind for me. But I think depending on where you live, you're going to be uh, seeing different endangered species. Yeah, I really encourage all our classes to check out wolfish when they're done. They're a really fascinating creature. They're very unexpected. You wouldn't think anything like that would be around in the oceans, or but they're they're really awesome. Miss um, Spicer's class, you guys do have a question, so come on up and uh, go for it. What is the coolest animal you've ever researched about? The coolest animal, no pressure. <laughs> mm, the coolest animal. Okay, that. Oh, you know what? Actually, I was helping a colleague with her Greenland shark research um, back when I was in university. And Greenland shark are super huge, super slow, and they're ancient. They're very, very, very slow growing. They're not sexually mature and they can't reproduce until they're about more than 150 years old. Uh, and they grow to be absolutely enormous and they've been around for so long and we're only just starting to learn a bit more about them. And what my colleague was doing was she was going up to the Arctic um, and she was going out on small vessel with a baited camera, which is basically a camera that has a bunch of fish on a pole attached to it. And the camera is facing the ball of fish that's at the end of this pole. And they basically wait to see what comes around to eat it. And these Greenland sharks would just mosey on up very slowly and just basically smash their head into the ball of fish and kind of slowly start eating, <laughs> eating the fish. And the cool thing about Greenland shark is we just don't know very much at all about them. So they're almost like a brand new species to us. And I thought it was really cool to be kind of on the first floor of studying that species with um, with my friend and colleague, Bryn. She's now doing research um, at the University of Windsor in Ontario um, with a, an Arctic research group. So she's continued that research even after graduating with her PhD. Super, super cool. I think that's literally the first time in the history of exploring by the seat of your pants that anyone has mentioned a Greenland shark. So thank you for that. But they're such a cool creature. Uh, that for sure. Check those out when you guys are done. They're one of the most odd and fascinating uh, animals in the entire ocean. So yeah, awesome. All right, guys. I'm going to take a quick question from YouTube. And then what we'll do is come back for a second round of questions with all you live groups. So let's go to Houston um, from Miss Wu's class. How do you sample the fish? And what are the details involved in sampling, Hillary? So for the Citizen Cod program, um, we take a length sample and that might not seem like a lot, but uh, getting a length sample or a length measurement can actually tell us a lot about the fish. So when we go out um, to sea to collect fish, we create a huge, enormous database um, as well as the port sampling staff. They also uh, contribute to this database. So the length um, we can relate to the weight and we can relate to the age. So just by taking the length measurement, which um, is a pretty quick process, we can learn a lot about, uh, you know, kind of the structure of the population. Um, yeah. What was the second part of the question? Can yeah, I'll bring that back up again for you. Uh, it was just, what are the details in sampling? So you mentioned that uh, getting their measurements is, is very easy. I think that's basically what they're looking for. Yeah, so another thing, that our port samplers also take otoliths from all the fish. So otoliths, what they are is ear bones. Um, so you think, why would you take an ear bone out of a fish? I didn't know there were ear bones in a fish. But um, what they do is you get them, you have to cut open the head and you can pluck them right out. And um, what we do when we take them back to the lab is we take a tiny cross section and then inside the otoliths, 
are rings, just like in a tree. And so when a fish is older, these rings are annual rings. So if you count the number of rings, you can see how old the fish is. This is also how we can relate size to age. So if we measure a fish and it's 50 centimeters long, we take the otolus and then we count the number of rings in the otolus and we find that, you know, 99% of the 50 centimeter fish we get have an o have four otolus bands. Then we know that fish, if a fish is 50 centimeters, it's probably going to be four years old. Um, we can also do this with larval fish and very young fish. So um, in our pelagic section, which is uh, studying fish that kind of live in the water column, um, they uh, use plankton nets to collect not only plankton, but also larval fish. And these fish are like maybe one centimeter long and they have like two black eyes and they have little uh, little dots down the back. And that's how you can tell the pattern of the dots is how you can tell what species it is. And people who have more dexterity than me will go in on a strong microscope and take the otolith out of this one centimeter long fish and look at the rings on that otolith. And when fish are that young, the, the rings on the otolith are laid down every day. So you can see how many days old the fish are. That's so another sample that we take from fish. Not only super cool by itself, but because it's World Fisheries Day, because we've got these amazing scientists from Fisheries and Oceans Canada, you can literally go on our YouTube channel back to earlier today and check out Diraj's talk, which is literally about otoliths in tuna. So if you want to check that out, the small world, go. Uh, I encourage you to see that when you're done. It's a nice follow up to today's talk. Um, so let's dive back in with some live questions. Mr. Foy, uh, I know you typed one in the chat bar, but come on in in person. It's more fun to see you. Do you mute your mic and uh, go for it? <laughs> There we go. So uh, we're kind of curious. Uh, your, your, your specialty right now is a citizen cod project. And I know that uh, years ago, uh, the cod fishery collapsed and we had uh, new people from Newfoundland moving to Sudbury to look for work. Uh, they migrated further west as well to find jobs. Um, how have things recovered over the years and what steps were taken to help with the recovery? So immediately um, what happened is there was a moratorium on cod fishing. So all cod fishing stopped completely for a number of years. Um, the moratorium started, I believe, in 1992 and uh, went on for a number of years. And then as we continued researching cod to see, you know, OK, are they bouncing back? Or are they doing worse? Are they doing the same? Um, and so after um, a number of years, um, they allowed, they did the research and they said, okay, this, the cod stock, you know, they are, there's, there's some fish there. Um, the commercial fishery, so the fishing for um, selling the fish to the market didn't start, but um, we did start something called a sentinel fishery um, and a, what's the other name for it? a steward fishery. So what these fisher, fishers do is they do fish and they can sell the fish that they catch, but they also have to keep very detailed log books and those get sent in to my colleagues in the fisheries sampling portion of the section. And basically these fishers are catching fish to sell, but they also are working for us in that they're collecting data for us. So they are um, stewards of the fishery in that they're helping us collect data about the fishery. Um, but they are also being provided a livelihood to do this. So um, they can sell the fish, but they also um, have to abide by um, some rules about data collection and things like that. Um, the cod is still, you can read up about this. We do a report and a stock assessment on cod every single year because we're always taking a look at it and we're taking a look at it these days from a larger perspective. So what it used to be was, you know, if you were studying cod, you just looked at cod, you didn't look at anything else. But now we're looking at cod, the species that cod eat, the environment, so the temperature of the water that they're living in. Um, and this is called a, an ecosystem approach. Um, and so instead of just looking at one species kind of 
very narrowly. We're giving a broad outlook because we know now how everything's interconnected in the ecosystem. So um, I believe at this time the co that cod is still considered in the um, what's it called? Uh, we use the precautionary approach, which means um, in with lacking lacking information we um, err on the side of caution and they are still considered to be in the critical zone which means we need to keep removals so the um, amount that we're catching we need to keep those levels as low as possible so what the science branch does is they do all the research and then we present um, the data for advice and then in the end the fisheries minister in Ottawa makes all the decisions based on you know the the advice from science um, research from policy and then also economics. There's so many things at play here, um, but we are keeping a close eye on the COD stocks because they are very iconic for Newfoundland and um, we wanna make sure they can be healthy and continue to grow. That was a very thoughtful answer for a very big question. I figured we would probably get that. We're getting it on YouTube too. So well done, you did great. Um, that's a tough one to cover uh, and something that we get every time we talk about Newfoundland and, and fisheries in general. So thank you guys for that question. Um, we're going to take three more. So Mr. Hashi Splash, if you want to come back in, go for it. Uh, just demute your mic and you're all set. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from one of my students, Logan, who is in Lively, Ontario. Uh, he asks, how many studies have you done? How many studies have I done? Well, I did the the weekly research projects in undergrad as well as that large um, muscle sea star project. So we'll call that six because there were five different projects and then the big one. Um, and then I did my major research project in, um, in grad school. So that's seven. And then um, at DFO, when I'm not working on the Citizen Cod program, I help contribute to reports on other species. So just last week, I was working on a report on lumpfish, those fun little fish that bob up and down in the ocean. Um, and <laughs> they're a lot of fun. Um, those are also raised for aquaculture purposes, so fish farming, because they love to eat sea lice, which are the little pests that live on salmon in sea cages. So they're really important to learn about because they can be used um, in that context. So um, a lot of times they raise lumpfish in tanks and then when you go up to feed them, they'll all come up to the surface and just like bob at the surface and they're very, very cute. You should look them up. Um, so when I'm working um, on those reports, I've worked on some reports for specific species. I've also helped on reports for um, you know, giving science advice for oil and gas projects and things like that. So it's hard for me to count, but um, I think my biggest independent study was probably my master's research. Hillary, you do it all. Jeez, take a break occasionally. <laughs> um, that's a, a fantastic question, guys. So thanks to our student in Lively. Um, we're going to go to Miss Spicer's class live in just one more second, but I want to share one question from Anastasia, or Miss Messier's class uh, online. I think I know where she's coming from with this. Did you find it hard to decode math problems when you were in school? I was... Um a bit, I was actually a big fan of math in school, but I did have a lot of trouble with advanced calculus. It was going, it was moving so quick, and I did have to ask for a little bit of extra help in that, um, and my teacher was very happy to help me out. Um, always ask your teachers if you feel like you're falling behind. Never be ashamed. Um, it happens to the best of us. It doesn't mean you know, you're know you not good enough. It's just that everyone moves at a different pace. Um, so yeah, some math problems are hard to decode. And I was not the best at coding or statistics, but you know, these things come with practice. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Geez, I do this for a living. You think I know how to do that? Um, so uh, a thing that a lot of our classes think, uh, a lot of students think, is that to become a scientist like you, you need to be a genius from a very early age. You need to know this and love it, and it's just not the case. So many of the speakers we bring on this broadcast start out in completely different fields, or they struggle with math or science, and they just you know follow, keep going with it, and they they follow that passion. They ask for help, and uh, I, I think that that's a really good message to share. So thank you so much, Hillary. Um, all right. We're running out of time. This is it's too much fun and it's time flies when you're having fun. So Miss Spicer's class, if you want to wrap us up, come on in, go for it. Hi, so my students are pretty quiet. So I thought I'd ask a question that I had. Perfect. Um, 
Hillary, with your experience and your occupation, is there anything that you don't like doing or what do you find hard or frustrating about your job? Uh, well, you know what, if you can believe it, when I was younger, I actually was very scared of touching fish, mm. <laughs> which sounds kind of funny, but uh, it's true. I was, I just thought they were so gross and I was very scared of it. And there's actually a picture of me on that first boat trip, um, that 28 day long boat trip where um, my colleague is holding a fish and I'm like, they caught me in the perfect moment of being like, I could just barely touch it, but <laughs> so at first I didn't even like to touch fish, but, and now I, uh, when I'm handling fish, I do like to wear gloves. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, as far as things I don't like to do, I can't really think of anything. <laughs> That's a good problem to have, but I, I like the fish story. That is, it's actually quite amazing how many people we've had on, uh, to start with things where they're completely uh, at odds with what they end up doing for a career. So thank you for that, Hillary. Um, <laughs> We are uh, fresh out of time. So guys, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Um, what I want to do, and Hillary, if you're joining us for the first time, we bring it on all the teachers that were live. So Mr. Hashi, Mr. Foy, Ms. Spicer, if you guys want to join me in saying a big thank you to Hillary for joining us today, you're all in. Thank you so, so much for coming in, guys. And check out Kevin Hedges' Arctic Fisheries presentation later. We got Greenland sharks coming later. Lower <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time.